Hi friends, welcome to the NPTEL course Strategy and Technology a Practical Primer. We are in week 5 with the theme of Buyers, Suppliers and Competitors. In this lecture, the 22nd in this series, we discuss the topic of supplier power. Suppliers are an essential constituent of an industrial ecosystem. The reason for suppliers to exist is the inability of any firm to do all the items, all the components, all by itself. Specialization of skills, specialization of technology and resource diffusion require the existence of a vibrant and strong supplier industry as part of any broader industrial ecosystem. As between a firm and its customers, the relationship between a firm and its suppliers also needs to be collaborative rather than competitive. Supplier firm differentiation, supplier firm connectivity, supplier firm behavior, and supplier clusters are some of the fascinating collaborative aspects of an industry structural evolution. Dual sourcing relationships are often heard of in the supply chain jargon, but they would depend on flexi designing being an integral component of the product development philosophy of the firm and the supplier. When the firm and suppliers are collaboratively aligned together, there would be a more competitive presence for this firm as well as the suppliers in the marketplace for mutual benefit. So we take a relook at Porter's strategic framework relating to supplier firm and firm competitiveness and examine how suppliers and the firm can develop a shared agenda for competitive behavior and competitive outcomes. The origins and end uses of supplier power lie in the following. 1. The firm's value chain is the primary source of supplier power. Suppliers exist at all parts of the value chain. If you look at the R&D situation, suppliers exist as component developers, as primary material developers, as uh, providers of analytical equipment, as providers of various type of R&D equipment, testing equipment and so on. In manufacturing arena, suppliers exist as suppliers of materials, suppliers of components, supplier of paints, suppliers of equipment and so on. So each part of the value chain, be it design, development, manufacture, marketing or information technology have got suppliers working all through. So value chain and supplier existence are interlinked. Second. Integration beyond purchasing is one of the important aspects of supplier power. We have to look at integration as the driver of supplier power. Integration has to be viewed independent of legal ownership, which we have seen earlier also. If you have legal ownership determining the supplier power, we could be mistaken in understanding supplier's role in the firm's value chain. Supply value chain the value chain of the firm and the suppliers are independent of legal entity behavior and legal entity ownership. Third, supplier power is no longer local or national, it is global. The purchasing strategy of a firm must have a global outlook because networking on a global basis provides certain advantages of technology and competitiveness. These decisions related to value chain, integration and global outsourcing are not everyday decisions, they are strategic decisions. We must have a construct at the firm level to perceptively deal with the myriad firm supplier relationships that would happen. And that should be done with an optical view of the tactics that is the day to day transactions and the visionary view of the end state that is the future wherein transformations have to occur between the firm and the suppliers for getting into different growth trajectories. So both operational that is tactical and strategic that is long term aspects of supplier firm relationship must be combined when doing supplier analysis. As with buyer power, supplier power also can be low or high. When will the supplier power will be low? Before we consider that aspect, we should consider suppliers or vendors as supporting the products of the original equipment manufacturers or the end users. 
When you look at companies such as Ashok Leyland, Maruti Suzuki, Tata Motors, we may conclude that these are the end product manufacturers because the products are straight away put into the marketplace, into the field for delivering certain customer requirements. Whereas companies such as Rane, TVS and Motherson or ancillary components manufacturers who provide their components to the Ashok Leyland's, Maruti's and Tata Motors of the world for them to be able to do the product. So when we talk about supplier industry, we talk about these uh, Rane's, TVS and Madhusans. But if you look at really extended value chain, even Ashok Leyland would be a supplier to the defense services. Even Tata Motors would be a supplier to state transport undertakings. Maruti would be a supplier to businesses and offices requiring passenger cars. Important thing about this is that they are so closely allied but so distant in terms of their strategies. Very few OEMs have moved into component manufacture on a big scale and very few, in fact uh, probably zero number of uh, suppliers have moved into end product manufacture. The relationship between OEMs and the suppliers are at arm's length basis and mutually collaborative basis in evolved uh, situations. When will the supplier power be low? When the supplier base is highly fragmented. That is, there are too many suppliers trying for the same pipe. When suppliers have only commoditized technologies and not proprietary technologies. When the original equipment manufacturers are very strong in their business, in their financial position, supplier power will be low. And when suppliers are weak financially also, the supplier power will be low. When will the supplier power be high? When the suppliers are very few. Today's situation, electric battery vehicle manufacturers are there in plenty. But battery manufacturers themselves are very few. The supplier power in battery manufacture is therefore at a very high level. Proprietary technologies govern the supplier power. If the OEMs are weak and they are not financially strong, then you will have problems of high supplier power. When the suppliers themselves have high financial power, the supplier power would be high. Although these component manufacturers have them to make and assemble a total product, they have not ventured into total original equipment manufacture. They didn't even consider it as a strategy at any point of time. Why is it that it is not only for automobiles but in several other industries also this has happened even when end to end it could be seen as a flow of chemistry or flow of chemicals. Even in continuous process industries the distinction between end product manufacturers and material suppliers remains. We should also be cognizant of the fact that one end product manufacturer could be a supplier to another fully finished product manufacturer. A manufacturer of active pharmaceutical ingredients is the end product manufacturer as far as the bulk drugs industry is concerned. However, the active pharmaceutical ingredient itself is a supply to finished dosage forms. So when you look at API business, you have all the inputs such as key intermediates, other raw materials, solvents, utilities, plant and equipment, containers for the bulk drugs as being the supply side of the API business. When you look at the finished dosage forms, APIs, excipients, that is those which are mixed with the API to make the homogeneity of the tablet, the primary containers, that is the capsule shell or the blister, they are the primary containers, packaging materials, that is the carton, the label, the secondary packaging, the primary packaging, these are all the packaging materials. Utilities, plant and equipment, these are the inputs to finished dosage forms. You can note from this graphic that APIs which constitute an end product are in fact a supply product for finished dosage forms. Pharmaceutical and chemical industries are characterized by different types of materials and suppliers. but the flow of one supplier being an end product manufacturer to somebody else is also feasible and very much visible to you from this graphic. Supply power is multifactorial. 
it is not just the form and uh, supplier relationship each supplier would also face supplier power from other uh, electric battery maker for example will face supplier power from cobalt supplier and this power may be accentuated or attenuated based on the products involved so just merely looking at the competitive strategy of the firm with reference to the supplier power may be grossly inadequate we need to look at supply value chain in a little more elaborate detail than we consider the buyer power because suppliers are multi strata i have given this example of key case battery materials leading to electric power pack leading to electric vehicle we have to understand the issues faced by electric power pack maker in far greater detail than we are currently undertaking of let us say a brake lining because the industries are under flux points of transformation are occurring not only at the component level but also at the technology level and also at the material supply level and in some cases there are huge geopolitical considerations also involved so the multifactorial nature of supplier power must be understood and analyzed what are the key structural issues in the purchasing strategy if you look at the supplying strategy or the purchasing strategy they are all in terms of uh, top tier suppliers or top tier oems however a supplier must look at the entire spectrum of oem manufacturers large or small and oem must look at not only tier 1 suppliers but also tier 2 and tier 3 suppliers total 360 degree mapping of the supplier oem relationship must be undertaken Ideally a firm should procure from vendors who will maintain or improve their competitive position in their own industry that is you must buy asbestos free gaskets from those who have got leadership in that technology you should buy self cooling radiators from those who have got standing in that technology when you look at uh, batteries those who have the ability to do highest energy density highest range must be looked at so structural and competitive analysis must be applied at the supplier level also to find out who is the most competitive supplier who should be forming a part of the strategic relationship between the company and the suppliers a contrarian strategy also can be taken we can take the suppliers who are low on the scale but consciously develop them based on the high potential they may have that also is possible so how do we do this supply structure issue in actual practice one create maximum leverage with the chosen suppliers that could be through volumes assured offtake good pricing collaborative relationship and mutually sacrificing when it is required then second way is to have stability and competitiveness of the supplier pool as a whole third is allocation of purchases among qualified suppliers and fourth is the optimal vertical integration outsourcing and offshoring these are the four ways in which st structural issues of supplier uh, power arise we think of vertical integration as a key strategic decision in purchasing however it is primarily based on what should be bought and what should be made by a company when industries are set for game changing transformations a whole new source of structural adjustment happens because startups are in a position to provide those kinds of inputs when passenger car is going to be autonomous it is not merely the in-house software development division of the company that matters but also the startups who are coming up with several modules of autonomy startups which are coming up with leaders with radars imaging equipment all of these suppliers who are basically in the startup arena at this moment they become important parts of the supplier ecosystem there are some conditions that create powerful suppliers supplier concentration non dependence on customers switching costs for customers unique or differentiated products threat of forward integration and so on and maximum leverage can be obtained through diffused purchases avoiding switching costs qualifying alternative sources promoting standardization using tapered integration etc the conventional thinking is that a firm's allocation of purchases among its suppliers is a key element in dealing with the bargaining power of suppliers that is 
if you have more suppliers the less will, will be the supplier power and higher will be the company power but this need not be so a weak supplier will never be a strong part of the value chain it is important that the suppliers are also strong and capable but not completely delinked with the firm's vision and strategy we have to differentiate the long run decreases in purchasing cost that would occur through a strategic approach to purchasing from the short run increases in cost when such strategies are put into place as a wise purchasing manager one should look at the firm purchasing from low cost suppliers but the caveat should be that benefits of sustaining and going with that low cost supplier would be in terms of long term bargaining power as well and the low cost supplier would have the technological capability and the financial sufficiency to be able to travel on the path of upgradation so fragmentation of supplier base or driving down of supply costs is not the only solution for managing supplier power in fact they could be counterproductive also the way to look at it is to have a more strategic relationship between the suppliers and the firm and to be able to do that one should understand the division of competencies between the suppliers and the firm if there is a core competency in developing a component or even a whole group of components that becomes the core competency of the supplier group how to manufacture chips is intel's job and not apple's job or samsung's job while apple and samsung could probably create infrastructure to do that and apple has already done it with its bionic chip in general if you have 100 manufacturers only one would be having the ability to have core competency in developing the components very few companies have the core competency in developing all the components and manufacturing all the components that core competency must belong to the supply side of the firm because supply side evolves as an autonomous but interlinked function the ownership and techno economic realities must be understood to understand what is the right division of competencies between the component makers and the end product manufacturers generally oems require huge investments and mega entrepreneurship whereas components require smaller level of investments and startup mode of establishing companies so oems are the preserve of the few component making is open to many people who have medium level resources and who have got technologies to start small with a brilliant idea and then grow big over time indian policy in particular has encouraged accelerization there is a ministry for micro small and medium enterprises msme ministry whose idea is to encourage these kinds of companies because we all understand that msmes enhance employment of the nation separating component and oems helps oems have the advantage of lower fixed costs leaner operations and agility which msme companies provide and once a component maker becomes an established player we need to have a situation or a system by which such player would diversify into another component rather than forward integrate into oem and that is how component level conglomerates have developed be it uh, mothers and sumi or tvs or rane at best a company may look at limited forward integration into systems manufacture several global and indian component groups offer striking evidence of this focused strategic approach you can see through this graphic the division of competencies in the global automobile industry between original equipment manufacturers and the component makers lexus of toyota honda acura suzuki infinity again of nissan nissan itself mitsubishi mazda are all original equipment manufacturers and they don't manufacture their components in contrast icin denso showa sumitomo mitsubishi sona yokohama tire manufacturer nippon piston ring company nha spring company these are all component makers and they do not manufacture end products but over time 
people have understood the need for integrating vendor development from the very start of the product development. Whenever a new product is taken up, the vendors are taken into confidence. In fact, vendors are asked whether they have new generation components which can help the development of a new generation of products. That is the level of collaboration that exists from the genesis stage. In addition, the need for OEMs to have a greater say in the development of new component systems has been felt in recent times. When you are looking at electric vehicle, it is not a question of removing the engine and putting a power pack. We have to look at native electric vehicle development, which means that the entire form factor and the profile of a component may have to undergo a change. Or flipping the proposition, the minuteness with which a component is designed to its new configuration by component technologies could pave the way for redesign of the vehicles. We have to see where the limits of both OEMs and components exist and any attempt to cross those limits would only lead to overall industrial inefficiency. The division of the competencies is also very helpful because once the component makers are specialized, they not only have one original equipment manufacturer as their demand base, but they could supply it to the entire global system through their component capability. That's how Sundaram fasteners and various other uh, component makers are exporting, not only to one country, but to several countries. Motherson Sumi has got a huge export business catering to Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, Renault and various other global manufacturers besides supplying to all the Indian car manufacturers. By remaining small and focusing on R&D, and uh, efficient manufacturing and with very little marketing investments, suppliers build core competencies and those core competencies are helping them get a global market. The second perspective is that because they are independent and because they are not visibly branded, suppliers are having complete freedom to exploit the total product market. Let's take an example. As opposed to an industry comprising 30 OEMs selling 30 million original equipment in the aggregate at an average 1 million end products per manufacturer, a duopolistic component supplier industry lets the constituents enjoy an equal share of 15 million components probably with greater profitability than the automobile manufacturer. That is, freedom for suppliers to compete exists. And this division of competencies and business interests works advantageously for both the constituents, that is the OEMs and component suppliers. In addition, supply of parts for the aftermarket service, that is for products in operation, is another huge market that is available for component makers. The independence and the ability to reach up to the parts market is a strong incentive for component makers to be independent apart from the ability to serve several OEMs as part of their supplies. Integration of technology also works to their advantage. There have been some examples in the automobile industry of component makers rising to meet the technological challenges with component level leadership self-cooled radiators, asbestos-free gaskets, parabolic springs, that is single-leaf springs, low-friction oils, tight-tolerance pistons, lightweight high-strength parts, camshaft, crankshaft, conrods, are all examples of components developed by component makers initiatives. On the other hand, there are few areas which cannot be tackled without active and continuous collaboration. Vehicle control computers and software, overall uh, profiling of the car, the interiors fitment within the car, external trim, external lighting, they all need complete technological integration between the OEM and the component makers. This can be solved to a great extent by concrete engineering, wherein the suppliers as well as the original equipment manufacturers work together from the design stage. But in each case, there is an economics deterrent integration level which must be looked at. As the automobile industry moves towards large-scale electrification, 
Each firm and its suppliers must rise to the challenges of collaborating for mutual win-win. What should be done? Old components must be phased out and new components should simultaneously be phased in. This may require phase out of uh, old manufacturing facilities and phasing in or creation of new manufacturing facilities as well. We need electric power packs for native EVs, hydrogen fuel cell power packs for uh, new EVs, hydrogen fuel cell power packs in the alternative. We need charging stations, we need battery swapping stations, we require additive manufacturing capabilities for rapid prototyping and different kinds of body materials. OEMs must focus on the interface and optimization of equipment and component design in this emerging situation. And component makers must similarly focus on interfacing and optimization with OEMs to be derived from similar interface with their material suppliers. That is, new generation components can come about only when there are new generation materials. So this is a value chain. Equipment maker, component maker and the material maker. And when we even go further down into metal and mineral extractor refiner. So this is the way the whole value chain works out. Another example of integration of technology is that the technological value chain of a component maker is far more elaborate than the OEM's value chain. Even evolved OEMs and component makers tend to overlook such a strategic view of the supply chain technology. Tablet computers would have received more powerful and appropriate chips from Intel and more appropriate operating systems from Symbion, Android, Microsoft at the first generation launch itself. It hasn't occurred because people only looked at assembly of computers based on the recently developed components. They haven't looked at what best and how best the components can be developed and what other parts of the backward integration elements needed to be looked at to improve the material and component supply. So technological integration for optimum impact needs to be a fine balance between ensuring faster go to market and greater proprietary confidentiality. So bargaining power of supplies does exist, but OEMs have significant leeway in deciding the direction and pace of component level technologies. OEMs can retain their proactive advantage by seeking design copyrights by having licensing arrangements and also having joint ownership of intellectual property for ideas provided and projects funded by the OEMs. Suppliers also can secure their bargaining power in this space even while planning for new component development by having a more open approach towards securing broad patent estates on their technologies. Component makers by having technological power through patents can ensure that their supplier relationship with the OEMs is on a strong footing. So certain percentage of their development budgets, both OEMs as well as component manufacturers should be to integrate component level and OEM level research. Generally R&D laboratories of both these segments of the industry do not talk to each other. It is important that they talk to each other and have combined R&D budgets, combined R&D pools to be able to develop the best possible interface between a new generation component and a new generation vehicle or a new generation product. This will lead to better cross fertilization of ideas and co-development of components and products. Along with this, we require collaboration of minds as between a firm and its customers as we talked about in the past lecture of co-experiencing the product development. We also need such co-experiencing of the new component development between the firm and the suppliers. So the relationship has to be more collaborative than competitive. In fact, suppliers need to have the same customer centricity towards OEMs as OEMs must have towards the buyers and the customers. This collaboration can be successfully nurtured in two ways. One, joint approach with aligned individual development. Second, individual approach with collaborative development. That is, the suppliers and the firm establish steering committees to discuss field performance, customer feedback, cost competitiveness, technology vision, new product timelines, capacity plans, best minutes and so on. So that the firm and the supplier have a platform to better dovetail their strategies. 
and a firm can position itself as a complete provider of information on components and therefore it will have better bargaining power with suppliers. In the individual approach with collaborative development is for both the parts that is the firm and the supplier to individually and collectively reach out to this customer and interface based on the feedback received. There is no single entity that is the supplier or the firm takes responsibility to do everything related to new product development. They do it individually and then pull the data collectively. Direct interfacing with customers provides significant additional focus for the suppliers on individual components and a more perceptive feedback. The current system is that once a component is supplied, it is the headache of the end product manufacturer to deal with the component's performance and the feedback is received through the company. On the other hand, if the component maker is also proactive and learns from the field what is going right or wrong, the impact in terms of its R&D integrity would be far higher. Therefore, direct feedback from customers is one of the important drivers of elevated supplier performance. In addition, aftermarket activities such as spare parts and after-sales service also provide valuable feedback to suppliers. However, the main interaction is always between the firm and the customers. These additional inputs provide better collaboration of minds between suppliers and the firm. When suppliers access OEM's customers directly and understand the levels of satisfaction and areas for improvement, supplier power is enhanced and enhanced in a positive way. Collaborative planning between the firm and its suppliers brings manifold results. So we should not look at short-run firm level performance maximization just through pricing or better volume deliveries. We should look at a whole gamut of component related issues as part of the end product. For example, prompt redress of performance issues, smoother production and inventory, agility to meet market volatility, preparedness for model changes, technology upgrades, better value chain performance and greater competitiveness. You look at the electric vehicle, we have the new components, motor, reducer, battery, onboard charger, electric power unit. We also know that electric vehicles have got various hazards including the fire hazard which has been flagged internationally as well as nationally. So to be able to address this we need to have collaboration of minds not just R&D laboratory level development which nicely packages a component into an electric vehicle and meets certain specifications. There are many more issues that are involved in such transformative developments. So how do we do this? We have to have steering committees and annual vendor meetings and in the case of launch of new products, even quarterly vendor meetings to be able to achieve this collaboration of minds for synergistic purposes. Then there is a culture of collaboration and institutionalized collaboration. There are four aspects of that. One, the value chain of the original equipment manufacturer must be clearly understood. Similarly, the value chain of the component maker also must be clearly understood. Both suppliers as well as the OEM must understand these two aspects. Then OEMs may prefer dual sourcing, but that should be accompanied by flex designing. This is the cultural collaboration that is required amongst the constituents of the supplier ecosystem. So how do the value chains of the firm and its suppliers vary or be similar? Let's take the finished product. You start with raw materials, intermediates, starting materials, develop the active pharmaceutical ingredient and package it in a container. And this active pharmaceutical ingredient which is packed in the product arrives as the API to the finished dosage form. But along with that and even before that you get the excipients and the capsule shell and together all of these make the finished dosage form and they are processed in the factory. And then those capsules are put in a blister pack and the product is packed. Every part of these value chains, both these value chains have the potential to build patentable proprietary technology. That is, you can make the API with more environmental friendly raw materials, with lesser number of intermediates and starting materials and in a faster manner. All that can be patented. In fact, the packing of the product for better shelf life can also be patented. Similarly, the excipients to be used, the nature of the capsule shell to protect the integrity of the medicine, 
the nature of the blister the way the blister is printed with the instructions all of that could constitute the proprietary technology or the finished dosage form manufacture for new proprietary developments a partnership between the firm and its vendor for strategic technologies and supplies aligning the endpoints of supplier value chains to the finished product value chain is very much required so the more value chains you understand the more effective will be your supply chain strategy and also management of supplier power for which will be because each of the above that is the raw materials intermediates and starting materials do have their own value chains and those must be understood otherwise there will be a kind of snowballing effect or drought effect leading to some disturbances which happen in the backward va integrated value chains what is flexi designing if you have a sole supplier and if you have a sole buyer then there is no issue of uh, different types of designs and different types of manufacture different types of commercial relationship one is locked with the other but this proprietary technology as a market dominating factor and freedom to operate as a risk mitigating factor are both required so supplier would have unique position let's say in which case exclusive relationship gives better access to supplier technology for the firm but such exclusive dependence also brings in risk of too much dependence on the supplier therefore the original equipment manufacturer must have in it a capability to design its products in such a way that products of two different technologies can be made so that components of two different technologies can be put in the same product it is like having two types of chips going into one cellular phone it is like two types of sensors being in the same cellular phone it is like two types of motors driving the same machine tool these are the kinds of flex designing options that must be considered so that even if one supplier is unable to provide supplies the company has the ability to switch the supplies this is particularly relevant when the proprietary technologies are deployed by suppliers to provide the components if technologies are all commoditized then such a problem would not be there but when technologies are proprietary and associated with suppliers innovation then you need to have flex designing to be able to integrate more than one supplier in your supply system so a partnership between the firm and its vendor for strategic technologies and supplies is advisable and dual sourcing would be an appropriate paradigm for a mutually beneficial and protective relationship there are three types of sourcing that are available single sourcing multi sourcing and dual sourcing single sourcing merits large volumes mutual exclusivity simple administration clear metrics demerits mutual vulnerability if the buyer goes out of business the supplier is in trouble if the supplier goes out of business buyer is in trouble complacency because we are locked in uh, with each other for perpetuity each party may take the other party for granted lack of benchmarks because you have never used a component of other manufacturer there is no benchmark if you kept on using the brake linings of only one particular component group never understood how other companies brake linings perform then you have lost out on the opportunity of having a potentially better component then lack of growth horizon because everybody is in the status quo there is no growth horizon no competitiveness that drives either the component maker or the end product maker you can go to the other extreme of multi sourcing that is total freedom of choice mutual negotiation potential for better technologies whichever is the best you take and cross pollination of ideas the demerits are economies of scale are further brought down quality levels are multiple so management of quality itself becomes a big issue multiple technologies require a lot of understanding and administrative complexity related to dealing with so many sources so a golden mean between single sourcing and multi sourcing is dual sourcing reasonable volumes co exclusivity potential for shared development simple administration demerits possible cartelization of those two suppliers failure of one can be a risk jockeying for favored treatment need to live with new technologies 
All things considered, dual sourcing offers clear advantages of balancing the OEM and supplier power. It brings the benefit of supply assurance at reasonable scale and viability. The benefits would essentially be with better technology and quality profiles than can be developed by OEM and the suppliers collaboratively. So as strategic sourcing paradigm, as supplier power management paradigm, we need to look at dual sourcing as one of the important aspects. But dual sourcing, as I said, happens well when you have flexi designing at the either component maker level or at the OEM maker. Many industries have not yet committed to standardization of internal and external parts. Standardization does not imply dilution of the differentiation advantage. A supplier of headlamps may have different shapes, sizes, form factors, curvatures, the lighting positionings for different car makers based on the design dialogue that happens between the OEM and the component maker. But in terms of the internals, there could be a lot of commonality. So this requires a lot of flex designing to be able to have different lighting integrity, different lighting angle, adjustments to ambient light, lamp life, cost level, titrated by each OEM to two of its suppliers so that you arrive at a commonality but at the same time be open to accepting some kind of differentiation. So one model may be with one kind of lighting system, another can be with another lighting system of another manufacturer. There is one strategy that is possible. But the more industry level standardizations happen, the more would be the contribution to standardization effort. There was a time when the USB connectors had to be inserted only with one side viewing the user. But today it is uh, both ways. So those are the kinds of standardization which are very helpful in terms of different uh, companies with different products and different usage parameters. Industries such as electrical, electronics, nuclear and pharmaceutical have to pre-register products and principal vendor supplied materials with industry level or government level regulatory agencies. This is a very useful way of flexi designing because basic standards are set and component makers and end product designers conform to those overall parameters while differentiating the products. So qualification of alternative suppliers as part of the strategy sourcing efforts would have the early product development and manufacturing activities. One should not develop a new vendor only after the product has been put into the place. That must start along with the genesis of the product. So flexi designing and development helps firms integrate alternative suppliers with low lead times. And this helps switch components and supply sources in exigencies in crisis or when volumes spike up beyond expectation. You can look at the vaccine situation. If you design your vaccine with only one type of uh, syringe or with only one type of vial in only with 20 unit doses or uh, 10 unit doses, when the demand spikes up and the vials become in short supply, you would not be in a position to meet the demand. However, if the whole uh, product is designed to take two types of vials, two levels of uh, unit doses, then there is flexibility in driving up demand. And if you are able to do that with uh, both imported and indigenous uh, products, you have even more uh, potential imported tubes. You can use it for uh, exports and uh, what is made in India, you can use it for Indian requirements because of the pricing advantage. So there are several options that arise from flexi design in making sure that supplier power is moderately and flexibly managed. Let's look at uh, some kind of uh, play out in real sense of flexi designing. Ashok Leyland, India's top commercial vehicle manufacturer, innovatively designed its vehicle in the 1990s and 2000s. What the company did was to integrate aggregates of different technological capabilities and different sources into one product configuration that helped the company combine supply chain ease and manufacturing standardization. The company could pursue a model of technological superiority despite dual or tri-sourcing. So in terms of the engines, it could feature engines of three different families, Leyland, Iveco and Hino. Eventually, of course, Hino became the largest selling engine. In terms of the gearbox, the traditional Leyland gearbox, the ZF and Allison transmissions formed the part. Axles were 
were Eaton and Rockwell, steering was ZF and TRW, and other components were in terms of multiple sources, TVS, Rane, Motherson, etc. All of these things were cleverly and uh, creatively optimized as one total drive chain and as one total vehicle configuration so that the internals were flexible in terms of supply chain management but the end product itself was one end product of course each had its own uh, specification profile as an output performer but the overall product configuration was uh, seen to be delivering in the marketplace to be able to do this the oem understands the overlapping customer needs well, establishes specification bands and possesses the ability to optimize in and integrate parts and systems of multiple origins. So supplier power could be significant partnership synergy. We have seen how suppliers are essential for any value chain of a firm because no firm can do everything by itself. It doesn't make technological or financial sense so we need suppliers suppliers need to be independent because they gain a lot by volume spread that comes with being independent but they also need to be collaborative because both oem and supplier gains a lot by aligning their uh, strategies and execution to new product development or better management of the existing firm so both the groups the OEM as well as the suppliers gain a lot by treating supplier relations as a collaborative axiom. Power dynamics between the firm and its suppliers need to be harnessed in a very positive manner. And that is far more positive in my opinion than was articulated in the Potter model. And the focus should be on leveraging mutual capabilities for market competitiveness. The technological strengths of suppliers and the market understanding of the OEMs must be combined so that there is better performance of the value chain and there is better developmental capability when creating new products. In the contemporary model of competitive strategy, the firm should respect the technological specialization of the suppliers and the suppliers should respect the pressures on OEMs for greater model diversity and higher performance at lower cost. When a company creates modular truck platform that is possible only when the suppliers of components also adjust their uh, offerings in a modular basis. If you have modular design of the product but the same internal components, the cost economics, the performance superiority will never be provided to all the classes of that modular uh, vehicle range. So we need to have suppliers who understand this philosophy of modularization. That means that both have to work together and with mutual respect. When the firm and the suppliers work together collaboratively with synergy, there will be a much greater competitive presence in the marketplace for mutual benefit. They also would be geared for better industry and business transformations, particularly when major transformations are likely to occur in the 2020s. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of this lecture. We'll meet again in the next lecture when we talk about competitors.